Well, hey, everybody. It's good to see you. Aren't you just so happy to be back at WordCamp? I'm just so happy to be back at WordCamp. I'm so happy to see old faces and meet new faces. And uh, it's, isn't it really nice to just have conversations with people and they're, about what you do and yet their eyes don't glaze over? It's really nice, yeah? Yeah, I love it. Uh, we, we'll just call this Geek Fest. But we mean that in the nicest way, okay? Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to get paid for every little thing you do. And although uh, Sue did introduce me, you know, we have this obligatory uh, slide about who, who am I. Um, so I do have a master's degree in instructional design. I started life as a first grade teacher. Um, and then I went back to school to get my master's degree, mainly because I couldn't find a teaching job. Believe it or not, there was a glut of school teachers at the time. I couldn't find a teaching job. Um, I went into corporate software development where I was a business analyst. And for anybody who doesn't know what that is, basically, I talked to the Big Bang Theory people. Well, I talked to the product people. And then I translate that so the Big Bang Theory people, you guys, can understand this. <laughs> and then vice versa. So that's what I did for many years. Um, once I got involved in, once I left corporate and started my own agency, which was called WP Roadmaps and Coaching, uh, but I recently rebanded to Triad Web Advisors um, after I realized that people don't really want you to teach them how to manage their own websites. <laughs> that was my that was my first shtick, right? Um, I started going to word camps and I started hearing people like you complain about scope creep not being able to control my client. My client's not giving me the content on time. All my projects are running over budget. All my projects are running over time. I don't know how to control any of this stuff. Well, that's all the stuff we kind of invented in the 80s and 90s in software development. And those things that we invented still work, but nobody's teaching that. So I thought, well, this is the way I can give back to the community. So that's why I formed the WP Project Managers Academy. And this is, um, I still run my agency. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pivoting to more of a, because I love the business analyst part where I'm figuring out what the problem is and what the solution is, I'm, I'm morphing, I'm, I'm pivoting my business back to something like that. And then we're continuing to do the WP Project Managers Academy. So uh, I just like helping people. It's my thing. But most people would be surprised to know that I actually said this <laughs> at one point in my life. I hate project management. I will never be a project manager. And that's because I was working in the financial industry at Wachovia, which is now Wells Fargo. And I went to my favorite boss who had moved in, who had moved out of the retail department and into programming. And I went to him and I said, Harrison, please, can you, I hate my boss. I hate what we're doing now. Can you please find a spot for me? I love you so much. And he goes, well, I do have some project manager positions. And as much as I love this man and as much as I hated my job, this is what I said. And then I, w I left there and went to work for a consulting firm where I learned how, well, the reason I felt that way is because if when you work in corporate, project management is just a bunch of busy work that keeps you from doing the job that you're supposed to be doing because you got to keep all this paperwork and all this stuff to make the project manager happy. But that's not how project management really is in real life. And uh, so that's what I'm going to help you with today. Um, in order to get paid for every little thing you do, there's three things you need to do. You need to know what every little thing you do is. You need to measure every little thing you do. And you need to control every little thing you do. The control part, that's the project management part. Um, so why is it that folks don't get paid for every little thing they do? Well, number one is they're giving quotes instead of estimates. All right, that quote, that, when you do that first proposal, that is not a quote, y'all. The fence builder can do a quote at your house because he can come, he measures the front yard, he measures the yard, he knows exactly how, much, how long it's going to be, he knows what his materials are going to cost, he knows because he's done it enough times how long it's going to take him, he can give a quote. He might still have, you know, uh, what do they call it, a contingency budget in there, like if he digs a hole and you know, uh, severs an electrical line that he's got to fix, so there's a contingency for that. But for the most part, that's a quote. We don't know enough after that first meeting or even after the proposal, even after the proposal is accepted, nine times out of ten, you don't know enough to give a quote. You should be giving an estimate. You should make it clear to your clients that this is an estimate, and uh, because it, just as it says, this estimate may change because this is our best guess based on what we know today. As we find out things going through the project, oh, here's a new requirement. Oh, you forgot to tell me about this. Oh, I forgot to ask you about that. That is uh, what's going to change that estimate going forward. 
And I'm going to tell you some really neat tricks so that the client is perfectly okay with that. Giving too precise an estimate too soon. This is something that uh, a lot of people do is uh, they want to say, okay, this website's going to cost $5,000, but they say that, like I said, right after the first proposal meeting. Right at, and they, you can't do that. We all want to try to package our businesses or make, our, make the end of the things easier for us. So we can just say, well, if it's a five-page website, it's going to cost X amount of dollars. I do not uh, adhere to that, nor do I um, promote that, because you may find out stuff during a discussion with the client to find out that you're going to be much well, better well-suited with a 10-page website. So don't ever, do, and they'll still expect you to do it for $5,000, because that's the price you gave them too early. Um, the other one is inadequate discovery, just as I said. You're not doing a deep dive discovery. You're giving that quote before you've gotten all the information. And I'm going to tell you how a deep dive discovery should look as, as well. Scope creep. All right, for those of you who don't know, scope creep, this is when you say, all right, here's, what, here's what's included. And then the customer asks for something, and then you say, okay, I'll just throw that in. Okay, and then something, and then you realize that you forgot to ask them something or forgot to put something in there, so you just go ahead and do it anyway. That's scope creep. Um, project delays, that's usually when the client doesn't give you the content on time, or they don't meet a deadline, or a third party that you've hired doesn't meet the deadline. Um, so then you've got project delays, which you might say, well, that doesn't really affect how much money I get paid. Well, yeah, if you value your time, it does. And now you've got to figure, you've got to shuffle your other projects around, or maybe you don't even have any other projects in the wings, so you're just twiddling your thumbs while you wait for this. So, that, so project delays could, could be a, really, a real issue. And then being the nice guy, or the nice girl, or the nice gal, I guess I should say. Um, we just want to be nice, you know? I'll just throw that in, you know? Because I know they want it. They didn't really ask me for it, but I know they want it, and I'll just throw it in. That's called gold plating, but it's still a form of scope creep at the same time. So this is the reasons. Does this resonate with anybody? Anybody see their, themselves in that list at all? Yeah. This is why people don't get paid for every little thing they do. Oh, I want to say something here, too. If anybody went to Nev Harris's talk this morning where he talked about... Um, if there is a recession coming, or inflation, or whatever the whatever name they're given to what is going on, be prepared. This is one way you can be prepared. So make sure that you're holding on to your planned profit margin. Okay, to know everything you, you every little thing you do, you need a project plan. How many people actually use a project plan for their projects? Oh, seriously? Y'all, y'all need to sign up for the academy. All right, um, project plan is so helpful. To even if you don't use it day to day in managing your projects, just to be able to figure out every little thing you do that you're probably not charging for, you need a project plan. To measure everything you need, you need uh, that you every little thing you do, you need a time tracker. Now, some of us who've been doing this a really, really, really long time, like Nathan, I can say, Nathan, how long will it take you to do X? Or how long will it take your agency to do X? He's going to know right off the top of his head. If you're fairly new or you haven't been tracking your time or you don't have this history to go on, you really need something to keep track of your times or your, your people's time so that you know exactly how much long it's taking and how, long are you pay how much are you paying yourself or how much are, or you're actually you know, giving yourself an hourly rate or how much are you paying your, uh, your team based on the number of hours that they're spending. Now, I'm going to tell you a little aside here. I don't believe in ever telling the client how much your hourly rate is, unless you absolutely have to, unless it's in your contract for, we will do X in X situation at our currently hourly rate. And if they ask for it, that's fine. But this is uh, just for an internal calculation only, your hourly rate. I don't believe in doing hourly work. Uh, it, it's not sustainable and... Um, it's just not the best way to do business, in my opinion. Okay, then to control everything you, every little thing you do, you need uh, proven processes, repeatable proven processes, and that's where project management comes in. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your project plan. Y'all, I'm not drunk, I promise. Okay, <laughs> I had a little ear infection recently. I'm having some inner ear problems, so I lose my balance a little bit, so just bear with me. Um, okay. Generally, a project plan is broken down into phases, activities, and tasks. 
you need to write down at least once, and y'all, it's tedious, it's, it's a pain in the... Mm-hmm. But if you do this at least once, write down every single thing involved in every single activity. And I'm going to give you some hints on some things you're probably forgetting about. So this is an example of the project plan we teach inside the academy down to the activity level. It's just the, fir- the, first, the first four phases. Well, there are more phases. But um, this is basically everything to the activity level. This doesn't really tell you much. Design and validate layouts. Well, that doesn't, how am I going to figure out how long that's going to take? Well, we're going to have to break it down further. So uh, if we break that down further to the task level, design and validate layouts, just as an example, comes down to secure formal acceptance of the site map. Because we've already done a site map, we need to make sure that, and the client has verbally said, yeah, that looks right to me. You want to make sure you get formal sign-off on that before you start the, uh, the layouts, right? In, in, the, in the methodology that I teach, we're just using this activity as an example. Um, so you're going to have to select and define your theme, agree on acceptance criteria for the wireframes, and you'll learn a little bit more about acceptance here in just a few minutes uh, when we talk about that. I need to look at my time. I started at 3.30? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> sometimes I either go way too fast or way too slow, so I'm just trying to keep track. Uh, agree on acceptance criteria for wireframes, create the wireframes, review the wireframes with the client, update the wireframes from client feedback, secure client acceptance, and update your project plan and your project notebook. Uh, by the project notebook, I'm, uh, we, and one thing we teach in the academy is to keep all of your documentation in one spot. Used to, back in the software development days in the 80s and 90s when I was carrying that portable computer through the airport like this because it was <laughs> weighed 40 pounds and looked like a sewing machine, um, we actually had a physical notebook. I mean, it was a big old binder that you could put on the, on the shelf. And I'll say a little aside about that. If you do that, even if you do it in electronic copy now, yeah, that can actually be a value add to your client that you give them at the end of the project. Here's all the approvals we did. Here's all the times we did we veered off course, and here's why we did that. And that way, if something ever happens to you, they have how their website was built right there. That's a huge value add for them. It uh, makes them. And if you tell them that at the beginning, they know you're not going to be the disappearing uh, developer, right? That that just leaves, and now they don't know how their website was built or how to do anything with it. Okay, so what's missing? Let's drill down to this first, uh, first task, which is secure formal acceptance of the sitemap. What's, what, what's really involved in that, okay? Well, if we drill down to the subtask level, we have to prepare an acceptance form, we have to submit that form to the client, then we have to store the form in the project notebook. Okay, those seem like tiny things, but they take time, right? So if you go through your entire project plan and you drill down to this level, you can be sure that you have noted every little thing you do. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions so far? Nope? Okay. Is it tedious? Yes. It's very tedious to do this. You generally only have to do it once, or let's say that you've always done brochure websites, now you're going to like veer, venture into the world of, of e-commerce, you'll have to do it again. <laughs> but it's so important to drill down. And, and look, you know what, even if you, just take your best guess. Just get something down. Take, you know, even if you, if you miss a couple of activities or you miss a couple of tasks, um, take your best guess. You can refine it later after you measure right? Take your best guess at how long you think these things are going to take. Now, this is a spreadsheet that we use. What we do with um, uh, what I I have for my students in the academy is we use a spreadsheet. We break it down to the task level, and then we estimate the hours. We estimate the low rate and the high rate, um, and then we estimate, uh, and then we get the totals. This is going to cost as little as $500, or it could cost as little as, as much as $1,500. This is that range estimate I was talking about earlier, that you don't give a, a, a definite price at the beginning. You, you know, you can give a range and say, this website's going to cost between five and $7,000, or this is going to cost between ten and $15,000. Um, and then you adjust it after the deep dive discovery, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, time trackers. 
because it's just me and because I'm an OG and have been doing this a really long time, I already know how long this stuff's going to take me. I don't use time trackers. But this is from an article that Zapier put out recently about all the best productivity tools. And this is their list of the best time tracking apps. And we just, somebody mentioned that we do a Friday chat in my Facebook group every Friday morning, and you're perfectly welcome to join us. Um, and this, we talked about this recently, and everybody's using something different, right? It's good to know what everybody's using. What do you like about that? What do you don't like about that? But it really doesn't matter as long as it's keeping track of your time so that you can use this going forward to create better estimates and know that you're getting paid for everything that you do. All right, controlling what you do. There are five essential processes for controlling every little thing that you do. First, you need a two-step proposal process or some other way. I'm going to show you what, my, what ours looks like. But... Um, some other way of making sure that you get paid for discovery. Excuse me, just one second. My drink is over here. Oh, can you get it for me, Melanie? Thank you. I'm getting a little dry mouth. Happens when you get up in front of people. You know, I used to do a lot of little theater. I can get up and pretend to be somebody else, and I'm never nervous a minute. But I get up in front of all you people, my people, and then you get nervous. The, 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 yeah, that, thank you. And, and you get all dry mouth and stuff. I know you're not judging me anything any worse than I'm judging you, which I never do. But still, it makes you nervous to be up here. All eyes on me. Um, so a two-step proposal process or some other way for making sure that you get paid for the discovery. Um, you need a, a process, a repeatable process for estimating. Um, somebody had a, a one of those clear, like a, what do you call those balls with the water in them and the, and the, anyway, I'm talking about a crystal ball. That's the way we usually use to, to, to estimate projects, right? A crystal ball. You got to put away the crystal ball method of estimating. There are better ways to do it. You need a process for deep dive discovery. Not just discovery, deep dive discovery. It's painful, it's tedious, but it will pay off in the end. And change management and acceptance management. And I'll tell you in a minute why I call that acceptance management and not approval management. Okay. All right, the first two kind of go together, the two-step proposal process and the estimating, obviously. So here's how it's typically done. You have a meeting with the client. You, you draw up a proposal. You start designing. You go to validate that with the client, and they say, no, 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 that's not what I wanted at all. So you do a revision. So you go back to design, and then you do it again. And then you do it again. It takes a lot of time because you jumped into design before you had all the details, right? Then you go to gather content. You go, okay, client, go get the content. Now that we've got the design all settled, go get the content. And that's where the project stalls because they don't get it done on time or they just disappear entirely and you never, ever finish the project. That happens a lot more than you think it does. So they finally deliver the content and now you got to validate again because it probably affected your design. So now you got to go through that again. It's not a good, it's not a good way to do things. Our two-step proposal process that I teach my students is to start with phase zero. I call it phase zero because if, it's not, if the proposal is not accepted, it's not really a project, in my opinion. You estimate the content. This is another thing people leave out is they don't estimate the content activities because they're not doing it. Their client's doing it. They just say, okay, I'm going to give you three weeks to get the client, the content done. No discussion with the client, no estimating of how much content is there actually to be created. Or we've already got this content, but we have to gather it together. We have to organize it. We have to put it somewhere that it's easy to get to when we start to build the website. So you have to estimate all those activities. So you come up with initial estimate stated as a range and then see if, they, if the proposal gets approved. If the proposal is not approved, that's the end of it, end of project, they didn't approve it. If they do approve it, we get a deposit for the entire first phase of deep dive discovery. This is how we make sure we get paid for discovery. We get paid upfront for, for at least that. Now, sometimes that's 50%, you know, the whole 50% upfront, 50% later thing, that doesn't work. But sometimes this is 50%, sometimes it's 60% or 70% because that's, when most of, that's where most of the time is, is in the deep dive discovery. Because, listen, let me ask you a question. If everything you needed to build the website was like sitting there on a shelf, here's the theme, 
Here's all the plugins you need. Here's all the specification for the plugins you need. Here's everything you need to build this website. How long would it take you to build it? Let's say it's a five-page website. How long would it take you to build it? About 20 minutes, <laughs> right? I mean, well, that's an exaggeration, but you're right, about a day. It's not going to take long if everything's already planned, everything's already put in one place. The development part, easy, easy. Where you should be spending the time? Planning, talking to the client, figuring out how it should look. Sorry, I get into my WP grandma mode and I start telling you what to do. I apologize, it just comes with age. All right, so if that, uh, so when we, we get that deposit to cover phase one and we go to uh, phase one, that should say go to phase two. No, no that's go to phase one because we were in phase zero. This is where we're going to do our deep dive discovery. So while we're doing this deep dive discovery, chances are we're going to find requirements that we didn't know about. We're going to find, oh, the client goes, oh, man, I forgot to tell you about those five pages we need. We need a page for each executive with their bio on it. I forgot to tell you about that. Okay. Accessibility. I forgot about accessibility. <laughs> so you're going to find out new requirements, right, that, that come up during this uh, process. Uh, it may be something you forgot. doesn't really matter but because you've already set the stage with your client very, very early on that, look, we're going to do this deep dive discovery, and chances are we're going to find new things. That's okay. We don't want to squelch anything simply because we've carved things in granite too soon. Um, so we're going to add those new requirements then we are going to adjust for any of those new requirements. We're going to update our project plan, and we're going to um, adjust for that. We're going to then now do a detailed statement of work. That is where we're going to put all of that detail that we, that we pulled together for the deep dive, create this detailed statement of work with a new estimate based on what we found during deep dive. And we're going to say, uh, now, if that estimate exceeds what was in the proposal estimate, we give the client the option to cancel. They hardly ever do. Because they were right there shoulder to shoulder with you when you discovered these new requirements. They know you didn't, in you didn't include them in the initial estimate. They're, they're usually normally uh, normal uh, wise thinking business people. They're not going to say, well, you didn't think of that, so you, don't, you can't charge me for it. They're not going to say that. So this, usually, this works nine times out of ten. So if... Uh, if the new estimate does not exceed what was in the proposal, we just continue on because they're already under contract. It's still going to fall within that first range that we gave them. If they do, they can cancel. And then we, uh, did I get that backwards? Did the client elect to cancel? No, they didn't. We go to phase two. If they do elect to cancel, we hand them that detailed statement of work. They can go to Fiverr or wherever they want to go to try to get somebody else to do it. The difference is that doesn't hurt your feelings because you already got paid for this part. So you haven't done any work that you're not getting paid for. This is how you make sure you get paid for every little thing you do. Okay. And that would be the end of the project. All right, so we've covered the two-step proposal process and estimating. Now we're to the deep dive discovery. How do you do that to make sure that you get paid for every little thing you do? Well, you break it down. This is one of the, we have six principles of uh, WordPress project success that we teach, and one of those is break the job down. Quit trying to do it in these big chunks. That might work for you. It's never going to work for your client. If you break these things down and get these, in, get, uh, in, I call them incremental approvals on the pieces of the website, you're gonna, um, you're gonna, you're gonna get a lot. It's easier for the client to get those things approved, and then when when you've already got it approved, and then there, a change has to happen to it, you can charge for it because it's already been approved. Um, and we do use a content first approach. I also teach that that we don't start any development till we got all the content. That way you're not worried, because you know what usually happens is you say, all right, they're not ready for the content. Let's just go ahead and build out the rest of the website. Then when they are ready for the content, we'll just drop the content in. But then they don't come, and they don't come, and they don't come, and they don't come. Well, all that work you did to thinking you're getting ahead, that's just wasted time of yours and wasted money where you've, you've uh, allowed it to eat into your project profit. So we're going to start with a site map. Then from that site map, we're able to create a content rough order of magnitude. Okay, we've got this many, mostly text pages with a few images. We've got this many pages that have to have videos on them. We've got this many pages that have a table. Whatever the content is, you do a rough order of magnitude of that content. This is the best way to, teach you, to convince your client not to do their own content. 
because if you try to tell them that they don't have the, the, the grammatical skills or the literature or the writing skills to do it, they'll push back. But if you show them how much time it's going to take and you have a business to run, you shouldn't be spending all your time doing this. Most of the time, that's when, that's when they'll, they'll acquiesce and say, okay, fine, we'll hire a copywriter or I'll let you do it. Uh-oh, did I mess up my, my sound there? I'm okay still? Okay. <laughs> Talk with my hands too much. You validate that rough order of magnitude with the client, that's when you create your proposal. Take that pro After the proposal is approved, the first thing we do after that is wireframes. A lot of people don't believe in wireframes. We do Now, what a wireframe is, we use low-fidelity wireframes, black and white, no, no design at all. The minute you introduce design, your client's not going to look at anything else until later, and they're going to come back and say, well, I don't remember you doing blah, 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 blah. Well, that's because you were focusing on the design, and I was trying to get you to focus on the layout. So we do the layouts in the form of a wireframe. That allows us to refine our content needs because now we've got a block for every place where we need content, every place we need a picture, every place we need a paragraph. So we can refine those content needs and say, oh, you know, here was what we estimated. That's going to be a lot more than that. Or here's what we estimated, and it's actually going to be a little less than that. So we don't have to do as much. It's not always more. Sometimes it's less. You validate that with the client. Then you move on to the content specification. You get that approved. And these things together, the layout specification, the content specification, the functional technical requirements, and the branding and styling guy, uh, uh, specification, all of those things together. I didn't show that all broken down, but that's basically how you would break down the deep dive discovery. And that's what goes into that complete website specification that I call the statement of work. Um, and then it also includes that updated estimate. So that's how we break that down to make sure that we get paid for every little step we do. Okay, so we've covered the first three of the essential processes. The next two go hand in hand together. And these are probably the most powerful processes in this list. They're all good, but these are probably the, the most powerful. So uh, in those first ones that we covered, we covered these three reasons people don't get paid. These next two processes cover scope creep and project delays. So to control, blah, 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 to control scope creep, you need to establish a solid change control procedure. Who has a change control procedure that they tell their clients about before they start a project? Are you kidding me? All of y'all need to sign up for the academy. You need a change control procedure. You need to explain that to your client at the very beginning. Change happens. Embrace change. It means more money for you. It means a better product for the client at the end of the project. So change is not something we always talk about. Well, the client came back with all these changes at the last minute, blah, blah, blah. And we complain about that. But you can control that if you educate your client on the front end about that change is going to happen. If, look. Change could be something as simple as, I've got this kick-ass developer who's working on this project, and she had to go out on maternity leave, but she went out two or three weeks early because she delivered early. Wasn't, so you didn't plan for that, but now you've got to make a change to the project, right? That's probably going to affect the timeline. So you probably can't find somebody right away. Or maybe you already had somebody in the wings, but they're junior. This person was a senior, so it's going to take the junior longer to get the things done. So that's why you definitely need to... Uh, Establish a good change control procedure. A good change control procedure controls change to the cost, the timeline, the requirements, or the resources. Even if it doesn't affect the cost, you still implement the change control procedure because that's your paper trail. That's your paper trail to, I keep making the same mistake, I keep estimating this wrong, now I can fix this on my next project. That's why you do the change control for every... And see. Most of us are like, that's a 15-minute change. I am not going through the paperwork on the change control process for a 15-minute change. You need to do it because anytime you skip it, your client's going to expect you to skip it the next time. It needs to use a change budget. What a change budget is is uh, an invisible bucket of money that you've established in the proposal that says, we're only going to use this money for change. I usually do that at 20 to 30% of the, of the total project. So let's say the project's going to cost $5,000. I'll take 
20% of that and say, okay, we need to establish this change budget. I, you know, it's not part of, I don't get a deposit on it. I don't, I don't ever get it paid to me if there's no changes. But if there is, then this is what we do. Um, and I'll explain a little bit um, in more detail about the change control procedure in just a second. Oops, let me go back. I didn't mean to click. It's invoked without exception. I think I made that clear. Without exception. Okay, did I make that clear? All right. Um, it's part of your contract. So they've signed on to that I'm agreeing to this, right? I'm agreeing to this change control procedure. You discuss it with the client up front and repeat it as much as necessary because repetition is what enhances learning. It doesn't matter that you have to repeat it over and over. And did I say that it's invoked without inception? <laughs> yeah, that's the big deal. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's how this works. Anybody can, can submit a change request. The client can do it. You can do it. A team member can do it. Somebody sees that a change needs to happen. So it's only a request at this point. I get, I get, um, I, I get annoyed with the term change order because that implies that it's already been decided that it's going to be done. No, this is just a request. And so did it get approved? If it did, are we going to take that? So then is that money going to come out of the change budget or not? This is a great way to prevent frivolous change requests. Could you, look, I thought I liked that color blue, but now that I see it, I'd really like for it to be a little lighter. I need it to be Carolina blue, okay? <sighs> no. <laughs> but, but if you say, okay, that's going to cost $500 <laughs> because it's going to take me, you know, it might only take you five minutes depending on the way you built your website, but they don't know that and it's a pain in the ass to do it. So they should have, they should have approved that to begin with. You can charge them for whatever you want. But, okay, we're going to take $500 out of the change budget to cover that, right? Okay, is that okay? Well, you know, I think I'll be okay with that blue. That's what usually happens. So you get paid because it's that money's coming out of it. Now, sometimes, depending on who the client is, somebody I've worked for before, I'll just add it to the end of the project. Most of the time, I'm going to invoice for it right then because it's a change. You go ahead and pay me, and we'll do it. Even if I'm not doing the change right then, I'm doing it in this phase, I'll still go ahead and invoice for it. I'm going to tell you all in a moment how much money this has made me this year. Okay, if, the, if it was not approved, you make a phase two list. Here's a, here's a way that you can get your foot in the door for the next set of improvements, right? If it goes to phase two and they choose you to do it, you get paid. This is how you get paid for every little thing you do. All right, I have a, I have a furniture store client. It's supposed to be a six-week project. All they wanted to do was take their catalog site and make it a true e-commerce site so that they, people could buy off the web. I personally would never buy a sofa without seeing it in person, but people are buying cars that way, so who in the hell knows? That's what they wanted to do, so I added e-commerce. Everything was going smooth. I mean, that's, the beginning part went really well till we started trying to move their point of, the data in their point-of-sale system in the store to WooCommerce. Not because WooCommerce couldn't handle it, because that POS system was a POS. <laughs> I mean, it was built, POS stands for piece of, hmm, um, because uh, it, had been, it was built back in, maybe D-Base, y'all, I think it might be D-Base. It's like, like still got eight character limits on things, and so they've got this, this code for what, the, you know, a living room sectional with a sleeper sofa is this code, but then they forgot what the code was, so they got it all mishmashed up. I've been spending the entire past year helping them straighten out their data. So that wasn't part of what I agreed to in the initial proposal. So I've done change request after change request after change request. That's a $12,000 project has now $25,000. Well, the client hasn't balked, hasn't even blinked because they know I'm doing stuff I didn't estimate at the beginning and they, they knew about the change process before we started. So this is how you get paid for every little thing you do. Even when a, even when a project goes, I mean, that project's over a year old, y'all. I keep going, when are we going to add the store? <laughs> We've got everything else in place. Um, I forgot the point I was just going to say. Anyway, this is how you make sure you get paid for everything you do. The other thing is adopt an acceptance management process. And this is what... Uh, is typically a, a good acceptance management process is. It focuses on acceptance rather than approval. Because approval, y'all, words matter sometimes, okay? The connotation of words matter. 
Approval means, well, Melanie, I'm not sure I approve of you. I'm not sure I approve of what you've done. But if you agree up front that, look, here's the acceptance criteria for this deliverable. Whether that deliverable is the, uh, the, the site map or the functional requirements or the design, here, here's what has to be in that piece, in that deliverable, for it to be accepted. And if you can, do, if you can go through and check off that it meets all the, those things, the client cannot come back and say, yes, but I thought I wanted it to, I thought you were going to do so-and-so. Or I thought it was going to include this. Really? Because up front you agreed that this is what it was going to include. So it becomes a check, it becomes an acceptance thing not, and, and less of a, an approval thing. It defines rejection without cause. That's what I just described, that the client says, but I thought, no, we have it all on paper, we have it all documented, this is what you agreed to. Um, it requires establishing that acceptance criteria up front for each individual deliverable and also the project. In writing, in writing. yes, in writing, thank you. Um, it also is part of your contract, and you discuss it with the client up front and repeat it as necessary. All of your processes, and there are actually 10 truly essential processes, which I'll show you in a minute, um, all of those processes, those last two bullets, are true. Should be part of your contract, the client agrees to it, and it should be discussed with the client up front and as often as necessary. So in terms of why folks don't get paid, we've talked about all of them except project delays, because both acceptance management and the change control procedure together is what helps control um, scope creep. So when it comes to project delays, you need to include the client when determining the timeline. This is another thing we don't do. You sit down with the client and say, okay, here is what I've laid out as a first draft. Are you going on vacation? Are you expecting any delays? Do you have a big product push that's coming up? So with my furniture people, they have the furniture market twice a year. I need to know when that is because they're not doing anything except that, right? They're not talking to me on the phone. I can't get them on there. Unless I go down to the High Point Furniture Market, I'm not going to be able to talk to them, okay? Um, so you want to make sure that they are involved in deciding what the schedule is going to look like. Um, use a content-first development approach. Does, does everybody buy into that? It, or, I mean, it, it's been a topic of discussion for many years in the WordPress space, or in web development space anyway, is... You've got to have the content before you do the final, before you do any design, really, because the content should drive the design, not the other way around. How many times, those of you who've done this, and I have in the past when I was new and first started, um, you do the design, they approve it, looks great, then they send you all this content, and you, as, you, as you're looking at the content, you're going... God, I need to change that layout because that's not going to work for the amount of for the same content they sent me. Unless you, unless you do the control on the front end, that's typically what's going to happen. Now you've got rework to do on your design. Clearly lay out penalties for not meeting the dates and provide incentives for meeting the dates. Um, <coughs> you'd be amazed what people will do for a sports shirt. <laughs> or... Uh, a uh, gift certificate, an Amazon gift, gift card, y'all. I'll do just about anything for an Amazon gift card, quite frankly. Um, you'd be amazing what people will do. But So like what I usually do, especially on a big project, I'll say, look, now this is not a pad. You never pad a, a, a project, a pad an estimate to take care of things you don't know yet. That's just because you can't measure it. You don't know what it was used for. That's just arbitrary, not wise estimating. But what I do is I will bump the estimate by whatever number, $500, let's just say, because it's easy math. Um, and then I'll say, guess what? If you meet all your dates that you've agreed to already, I will give you a $500 discount. It's not really a discount because you added $500 to the estimate. But for them, it's a discount, right? Um, so, but not everybody's motivated by money. Some people are motivated by a sports shirt. Don't know why. Or dinner out at a fancy restaurant. Or just a beer with you. You know, there's all kinds of things you can use as incentives, but you also have to clearly spell out penalties for men not meeting the dates. And I'll tell you, the best place that I have seen for how to do that is Monster Contract. <laughs> Does everybody know that's Nathan's product? 
Uh, that's the contract I use. It's the contract I teach my students um, uh, because it, it covers, it's got a great way of laying out. If you're this far behind, this is what's going to happen. If you get this far behind, this is what's going to happen and so forth and so on. So I've adopted the way that he does it. And he's adopted the change budget. You know, so it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this, you're always going to learn something new. Never stop learning, never stop listening to other people because you're going to hear something and go, that's going to help my business if I do it that way. Um, oh, and make sure that you invoke your change control procedure without exception. without exception and you ensure that your acceptance management process specifies turnaround times and consequences for noncompliance, just like with everything else. You're going to... Um, so you're holding that carrot out in front of them saying, you know, do your thing the right way and here's what you get. These are the elements of a good change control process procedure. You don't have to take a picture of that slide because I have a download for you along with the slides that you can download a list of this. But I'm just going to go over this real quick. Uses a change budget, defines what constitutes a change because some people don't understand that. So you have to say, basically, if there's a change to anything that has already been formally approved, that's a change. So it defines what constitutes a change. It identifies who can initiate a change request, establishes that all change requests are in writing, identifies who will assess the impact to the project, because that change request comes in, somebody's got to say, how long is this going to take? Is it going to impact the timeline, the cost, the scope? What is it going to, what is it going to affect? Um, uses a change request log. That's really more for you. Than, than anything else because it's another way for you to come back, uh, look, at your, look at your project documents, capture your lessons learned, and turn them into best practices. So by keeping that, that change control log, you can go back and say, you know what, we, did the, we had to make that change on this project, and this project, and this project. Let's see how we can improve our processes to not keep making that change, right? Um, specifies where the change request will be maintained, where your project notebook's going to be. Uh, who will approve or reject the change request? That's typically always the client. Um, specifies how long uh, change approval or rejection should take. What happens if the client does not respond? And when is the payment for the change request due? That's pretty much the elements of a good change control process. The elements of a good acceptance management process are that it identifies all the deliverables to be approved. It specifies acceptance criteria for each deliverable and the final project. Sometimes you can do all of those up front. Sometimes you can just do each uh, acceptance, each deliverable separately as you're getting ready to do it. Um, it identifies who's responsible for rejecting or approving. I kind of use approval and acceptance interchangeably until we start talking to the client. Um, specifies the turnaround time, clearly states what happens when the turnaround time isn't met, defines rejection with cause, and describes when and how the rejection with cause is applied. Um, so all of this, too, this is acceptance. <laughs> that's why I did that, that, that photo on there, because uh, acceptance is more than approval. Okay. So these are the 10, so we talked about the five that you need to control every little thing you do. But there are really 10 essential project management process, processes that you need in your agency. One is the, uh, why did I skip number two? I'm not sure. I don't remember uh, animating this slide, actually. There it is, it's estimating. Um, let's just go and do them all. Okay, so here are the 10. Two-step proposal process, estimating, requirements definition, issues management, and risk management. Um, that's not related to what we're talking about today, but still very important. Content first development, how are you going to do that? Your technical approach, which is typically your tech stack, your plugins, how are you going to uh, configure those plugins? Client management and communication, that's, you know, basically Nathan's book on controlling friendly monsters. <laughs> Client management, very important. Change control and acceptance management. Now, are there any questions at this point? See, that means one of two things. I suck at what I just taught you, or I taught you so well that there's no reason to ask a question. <laughs> okay. Um, now, if you want to learn more about this, what? Yes? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You were very, very good. I would love to take whatever you have. Okay. I'm getting ready to tell you about it. <laughs> okay. I had talking to yeah, I kind of lost the question. Uh, do you usually have to do the content for the client to speed things up? 
It depends on the client. There are some clients that are great at writing their own content, and, but most aren't. I do it for some because I used to be a technical writer. But the, stuff, the problem is the stuff I write sounds like technical writing. I'm not a good marketing writer. So if, if, if the client isn't going to do it, I'll hire a third party, a copywriter. Okay. I truly believe in outsourcing to the people who do these things best. I've got the mic. Who's got a question? Nobody? Okay, well, all right. <laughs> Another question. Follow up. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking about uh, doing planning websites for customers. At one point I was. This seems like this is something that I would probably need. I don't necessarily want to do everything. I just kind of want to sit down with the planning. Can you right. That? Yeah. I don't see, you know, people talk about niching. The niches are in the riches. That's why it's not niche. Because when we're, niches are in the riches, it doesn't, it doesn't, the riches are in the niches, it doesn't work. Riches are in the niches. That is a way of niching down. In fact, I have just changed my business to focus on the business analyst part, the figuring out the problem and figuring out the solution, but I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to build the solution for people anymore. I just want the recurring revenue. But I want to, I want to, uh, I want to farm out to you guys. I want to farm out to other people to do the actual work and pull that team together. At that point, I've now behaved as the project, as the business analyst and the project manager. So if all you want to do is, is act as the, the planner, if you, I, I think that's, there's a definite need for that. But, you know, who I'd go to first is uh, digital agencies who don't have people doing that. Yeah. In other words, don't try to go to the end client. Go to, the yeah. go to a marketing agency that needs that, that skill set from you. That was my advice. Another question? Yeah, the question I have is, do you do that for every single project, no matter how much it costs? Do I do what? Do you do this for every project? No matter, no matter what, how much it costs. Yes, but sometimes a scaled down version. Oh, okay. Yeah, what I teach people is the, they told me not to use this phrase because I think it means something nasty, but I use the Mac Daddy version. The, I, I give you the Cadillac version. This is everything you could possibly need to do an enterprise level project. And you have to scale that back if it's a mom and pops and a five page website, right? Exactly. So you need to go through all these steps, but you could combine some of them or make them shorter. All right, so look, we'll go on to more questions in a minute, but if you want to learn more about this and more about how to get your projects done on time and within budget, then uh, I invite you to join our academy. And this is where you can learn how to consistently complete your work. This is my elevator pitch already. Learn how to consistently complete WordPress projects on time within budget with features that meet the, business, the client's business requirements without sacrificing profit. Because we can usually do it by working 60, 70, 80 hour weeks to get it done when things get behind or get off kilter, but that is sacrificing profit when you do that. The, so we have a basic membership that's free. That's to let you get in there, figure out if it's going to help you or not. Um, but you can upgrade to the premium at any time or you can cancel at any time. So the basic membership is the project management 101 stuff. We also have a certification program where you can get certified as a uh, WP project manager, which gives you additional uh, social proof and credibility. Um, but here's, well, here's, here's something interesting I just did. You might already be a project manager, and I just put a, a self-assessment on the homepage of my website so that you can answer these, uh, I think it's 12 questions, um, and, and figure out where you fall in the expertise in project management spectrum, okay? Um, and I'll show you the URL on our final slide. So let's review for just a minute what we covered, and then we'll go back to questions. You need to know every little thing you do. You need to measure every little thing you do. You need to control every little thing you do if you want to get paid for every little thing you do. You need to, if you want to know everything you need to do, that every little thing you do, you need a project plan. To measure, you need a time tracker or history to, have, uh, to be able to have measured that, uh, that time. Um, and then in order to control every little thing you do, you need proven processes that control all the stuff that we, that we complain about, y'all, can actually be controlled if you know how to do it. And that folks don't get paid because you need to stop giving quotes instead of estimates, don't give too precise an estimate, inadequate discovery, scope creep, and project delays. Your essential processes for controlling these things is the two-step proposal process or some other form. Some people will do the discovery as a separate project and get paid for that, and then they hand it to the client. I like to do it my way because that way, if we come in uh, with the, with inside the range we already gave them, they're already under contract. They can't just take it and go somewhere else. They could, 
but most people adhere to contracts when they sign them, not everybody. Um, estimating, deep dive discovery, change management, and acceptance management. So that's my talk, y'all. And here's all that contact information if you want to, uh, to, to see my stuff. You can get the slides uh, at wproadmaps.com forward slash speaking. I don't think that's the right URL. Try it and see what happens. Okay. Well, I had a redirect. I renamed the page, so I'm not sure if that's really where it goes or not. You can go to the home page. There's a title. They're in the main menu. It says speaking. Go there. Uh, but the other two I know are right. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. We have um, time for questions. Anybody have a question? Any more questions? You. So back when you were talking about uh, documenting all of the activities and continuously breaking down, what if what you're being contracted to build hasn't been built before, and so you don't know what's going to be involved in those activities yet? You take your best guess, you give the estimate as a range, and say, as we find things out, we will do, we will, we will adjust this estimate. As, when we do the second, we do the big statement of work where we found everything out, then we'll tell you, uh, you know, Sorry. we'll give you a new estimate, and, and, and then we'll go from there. It is? Thank you. The URL is correct. There's uh, just one last thing that's just interesting to probably everybody here, but I asked a question earlier. How were we getting those transcripts? I didn't know if that was AI or whatever. Apparently, and I think the guy back there knows, it's human. There's people typing that almost in real time. And I thought it was fascinating. I thought we didn't have a fascinating note. Beth, thank you very much. Anybody else? Any questions? I'm, I'll be around. At, you know, come talk to me if you're interested in learning about this stuff or you just have some questions. You didn't want to do it in an open forum. Um, I'll be at the party tonight. I'll be all here all day tomorrow. So please come talk to me. I'd love to help you.